I want you to do another movie with Paul Rudd. I do too. <laughs> yeah. You guys have this instant chemistry that, yeah. and it looks like you just make it all up as you do it, but it's, you know, it just, you play off each other so well. Thank you. I love Paul very much. He yeah. is, I feel a real creative kinship with Paul. <laughs> and I will say the closest dynamic I have to that is with Jessica Williams on Shrinking. Oh, she's great. Yeah. She's amazing. It's it's this thing that I, ha uh, that I have with Paul and I recognize with her of that, we the Venn diagrams of our sense of humor overlap in a pretty big way. Yeah. We like we we think each other are funny, right. which is really important. <laughs> and then also, we will follow each other down the path to hell <laughs> before we let someone walk down it alone. Yeah, <laughs> like if someone starts doing a joke, the other person is going to catch the ball and and keep throwing it back, even it, even if we're not sure if it's good. That's wild. And it's really important because yeah. it turns out you're only gonna use one of the takes. So if, yeah. if, if it's not that good, it's okay. Mm. Like you gotta be brave because they, it's not gonna get used if it's not good. But sometimes at the end of those roads is some really weird, funny stuff. <laughs> like Paul's character in Forgetting Sarah Marshall is almost all stuff that's on like the end of one of those right, roads, yeah. you know? <laughs> I thought I told you to sit down. I told you that if I sit down, I'm gonna feel like I'm in trouble. You are in trouble. Paul, I think I can help people if I just get my hands a little dirtier. Hey, you? be me for a second. Would you trust you? The answer is no. Well, you didn't let me be you, okay? Here. You gotta be kidding. Well, Jimmy, sorry for always being so hard on you. It's only because I love you with all my heart. I don't talk like that. Look, kid, I'm worried about you. Welcome to the actor's side. And today, well, this is an actor who's been in a lot of stuff on the small screen and the big screen. Um, you know, in terms of early in his career, Freaks and Geeks and Undeclared are cult hits now, I think you might call that, Jason. How I Met Your Mother, over 200 episodes there. Dispatches from Elsewhere, a lot there. And then, of course, great movies, Knocked Up, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, I Love You, Man. One I, I've talked to you about before, End of the Tour, you were yeah. phenomenal in. Oh, thank and you. So many, such great work uh, on all the screens that we watch stuff on. Uh, welcome, Jason Siegel. Thanks a lot. It's good to be here. <laughs> good to see you again. Yeah, well, yeah. the one I didn't mention is Shrinking, yes. which uh, has had a very successful run for its first season on Apple and yeah. uh, is coming back uh, uh, you know, for more. So how did you get involved in that? They come to you with this idea, and you know, very few actors have played therapists on the screen, Bob Newhart being my all-time favorite. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is a therapist like no other. Yeah, well, uh, I got a very dreamy call from Bill Lawrence a couple years ago who yeah. said, um, hey, we met a decade ago and I'm trying to figure out what my new show is. You wanna try to make something together. So, you know, I felt very lucky. And so we talked about a few ideas and then finally he and Brett Goldstein yeah. uh, from Ted Lasso, yeah. um, who I'm just a huge fan of, pitched me this idea about a therapist who himself was going through a nervous breakdown right. and was grieving the loss of his wife while he continued to practice therapy. And it just felt like, look, I didn't know if I wanted to do TV again. Because right, you've done a lot. I've done a yeah. lot of TV and I did one for almost a decade. So it's just, a, it's a <laughs> lot of TV. Um, and I think the old style of TV comedy, it's, um, it's intentionally repetitive right. because you're trying to get into syndication. <laughs> and in syndication, the goal is that you can check in at any time. You can pop sure. into an episode and it's comfortable. Yeah. Um, but I like telling stories with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I wanted to play something with a journey. And um, this new streaming format where there's 10 episodes, it's a lot more like a movie. Right. Um, with more time to explore side characters and all that. And when we talked about this idea of somebody starting at rock bottom and by helping other people, they were helping themselves, uh, I was in. I've heard him described by you as a psychological vigilante, which yes. I love that yeah. <laughs> description because he is. He's, he's, of course, his wife died and he's bringing up his daughter and there's all kinds of things going on in his life. And you are going against all the tenets of the profession here that you are in here. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if you're not careful with therapy, uh, 
it might seem as though the goal is not actually to get better. Right. It's more a place to go weekly and uh, wax about your problems right. and someone just to sit there and listen to you. Yeah. Um, and the show kind of finds a guy who is tired of being stuck mm. and believes his patients are probably tired of being stuck and they don't even realize it yet and is like, how do I get this moving? How do I, yeah. how do I get people's problems um, at least a step towards hope by the end of today's session? Yeah. And it's, it's based on a real guy who basically said, I'm just going to tell you what to do. It's so clear what you should do. And I don't know why as therapists we don't just say it. I'm going to start saying it. So it's based on a real guy? It's based on a real guy, yeah. Wow. And it's, I didn't know that. It's wish fulfillment, really, yeah. that someone will just tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah. Because as friends you do it. Mm -hmm. You're sitting with your friends who are talking about their terrible relationship. Right. And everyone's just like, just leave him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but a therapist doesn't do that for some reason. Right. Well, what if they did? Wow, that's interesting. You yeah. know, and it goes in such interesting places. Getting the tone right in a show like this is so dicey because it's dealing with grief. It's dealing with a lot of drama. It's coming from a dark place, but it's a comedy. Yeah. And so you have to, and I know as a producer on it too, you get more than a normal actor might, you get to go in the editing room and watch your performance and see how you develop it and all of that to make sure you get the tone right. Yeah, well, I try, you know, I have uh, a lot of experience from my early time with Judd Apatow and in that right. world and the movies we made back then, where a big part of the approach was, um, you have a scene, uh, you have a blueprint for it, which you should be able to shoot. Like, mm -hmm. it, it should be that if you just shot the script, it would be great. Right. But let's use that as a canvas to jump off of and explore, like, what's at the edge of these borders here? Yeah. Um, and so I think stylistically, I try to give a really big range so that there's this, like, third stage of the process, which is editing, where you get to kind of do another round of writing, kind of. Like, yeah. you have all the tools there to choose from. Um, and I change the performance a little bit, yeah. there, right? Yeah. Yeah, you get to you get to refix the levels in there. I think another thing which you take for granted is that, and I've sort of made a career out of it, uh, <laughs> like a grown man struggling. You know, yeah. <laughs> I think that uh, rock bottom sounds like a sad place. Yeah. Right. Seems right. like oh gosh, that's as bad as it can get. But actually, the day before rock bottom is the worst. Because uh, there's there's a little more to go. Right. You're still going down. Yeah. Rock bottom's actually a pretty hopeful place. Yeah. Because you're at the end of the fall. <laughs> the only you don't know it yet, but the only place to go is up. Right. So when you start a character at rock bottom, it's actually a very hopeful journey you're gonna go on because you can watch right. somebody pull themselves out of it. And out it's probably it. gonna be funny because you're crawling. Yeah. If someone starts the show or the movie and it's like their wedding day and they get a promotion, <laughs> uh -huh. I'm like, uh oh. This, this ain't going to go well. No. You know, that's funny you should say that. I, I remember when you say that, the show Rhoda, which was great, mm. but Valerie Harper and everything, first eight episodes were just killer because she wasn't married yet. Uh -huh. And the minute she got married in episode eight, they had five more seasons to go, and it became the fight of the week kind wow, of thing. Wow, right, right, right. And I, that's when you said that, I go like, yeah, they had nowhere to go. Here, you're absolutely right. Not just with your character, but with this great ensemble that you put together, however you did it. They all have their own yeah. issues and things, and some are become the therapists to other characters in a yeah. way. Yeah, I think that's what's hopeful about the show. Uh, it's been hopeful in my own life as well, is that when you finally articulate that you're having a hard time, right openly and honestly, it turns out all the people around you are, it's like water to a dry sponge. Yeah. People are like, oh my God, me too. Right. <laughs> you know, and then you, all of a sudden you're in this thing together. And yeah. that's what happens in our show is like, slowly you see, oh, everyone around here is going through their version of hell. Yeah. And let's get through it together. Yeah, which is like life. Yeah, it's, it's life. A show, but that's why, that's why it's successful. Because yeah. people can recognize themselves in it, even yeah. if they, don't want to. Yeah, well, I think that one <laughs> of the things that Bill uh, does really well, it's the way Brett sees the world and it's the way I see the world, is that um, grief, representing grief through grief, heavy on heavy, it's just too much. Yeah. It's not, especially for entertainment, it's not how you want to spend your hour at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But I think that life 
is actually more like you laugh your way through the hard moments. Right. And uh, it's just, it's like early James Brooks. It's all the wow. things. Life is kind of all the things, yeah. you know? I saw your co-star. He's so great. I'm so glad you've gotten him into television here, Harrison yeah. Ford. Yes. Who seems to be now, like, he's got another series too, 1923. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But yeah. he's so good, and he's so good with comedy. And, you know, I've seen him do that. The Indiana Jones movies were, like, there's a lot of comedy in, in that character. But it's great. He was on uh, Stephen Colbert or something talking about... Did you know him? And he said, no, but I saw him. Yes. Uh, that was a very funny story. And he's very funny when he talks about this stuff. Yeah, well, you know what? I think we all have parts of us that we know about ourselves that we would like to be known. Yeah. And Harrison has gotten the opportunity to be wry, right. you know, <laughs> in these things. But he's never gotten to be, like, full-out funny. Right. Like, Peter Seller is funny. Yeah. And none of us even anticipated that he would be doing that. We thought maybe we would do comedy around Harrison Ford and he would be gruff. Right. Like that was sort of the limits of our imagination of what it would be like. Yeah. And then all of a sudden Harrison showed up and he kind of took stock of what was happening on set and was like, okay, watch this. <laughs> and then there is an episode, I don't, I think it's fine to give it away, about halfway through the season yeah. where Harrison Ford shows up to a party stoned. Yeah. And terrified. <laughs> yeah. And it is, it's broad comedy. Yeah. It's as funny as I have seen anyone be on screen. Yeah. Um, and I think there was a moment that was very tender where Harrison Ford came up to me after like they yelled cut and people like burst out laughing. Right. And he walked past me and he turned to me and he really quietly said, I knew I was funny. <laughs> See, and yeah. even for if you're Harrison Ford, sometimes Hollywood doesn't give you that opportunity to really do it. You yeah. Know? And I, I think people love seeing him, and then it must be like amazing to have him on the set and you know working on this show. I struggle in my life with feeling like something is wrong, <laughs> like it's not things aren't going right. Uh, yeah. I didn't quite do it. It's really tough to be doing a scene, standing across from Harrison Ford, and feel any way except <laughs> seems like. Things are going just fine, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I'm like, oh, I did, I did it. It's all good for Jason Siegel yeah. now. So you're going to coach the Lakers. Yeah, yeah. We're back. I'm for excited. Two. That's another show you do. That I, I, it's a great show called Winning Time. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I love, I love doing that show. I love being on that show. Paul Westhead. Yes, my, <laughs> my responsibilities on that show are very clear, and it is, it's a, you know, like I have a lot of jobs on the stuff I do usually. Right. On this. Uh, I'm just an actor and my winning time, my job is to show up and like nail those scenes and it yeah. feels like it is just so fun. And he's a real guy. So what do you do as an actor to prepare to, to do that? I try to distinctly re like remove from my brain that he's a real guy because <laughs> I, uh, you know, that show is, is, it's a little heightened and it's crafting these sort of Shakespearean arcs. Yeah. You know, it's like palace intrigue within the Lakers organization right. and, and that's intentional, you know? Uh, and the Paul Westhead arc that I get to execute that they've created is like watching somebody step into their own manhood and then get corrupted by that power. Like right. they can't quite handle holding the ring, yeah. you know, <laughs> and become, you know, uh, he ends up feuding with the magic and, right. you know, history tells us it didn't go well for Paul Westhead yeah. uh, in, that, in that dynamic. Uh, and I try to play it really... Um, arch and <laughs> triumphant and, right. and just like a little bit heightened. Well, you're a tall guy. Did you ever play hoops? I did. I have two state championships. Wow. Yeah. So this is... Uh... Oh, yeah. My nickname in high school was Dr. Dunk. <laughs> yeah. Do you tell people that on the set? I tell it? everybody every chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, though. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a really good show. I I think too. You know, I mean, yeah. and I've noticed, and and I reeled off some of your credits here uh, when we started, but you seem to have a very good idea of who you are as an actor and what you want to get involved with. That's a really nice compliment. Thank you. Um, I think with retrospect, I, I think that's true. And some of it has been that like, um, what came my way, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know why, but it seems like what came my way was exactly what I needed artistically at the time. Uh -huh, that's um, there was a period in my twenties, you know, I got, I, I got very lucky very early on in my right. career. And so my twenties were kind of nonstop. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that is a side effect of being so very, very lucky 
-hmm. is that you're not forced to stop and think about right. choices because yeah. they're just coming your way. And um, when How I Met Your Mother ended, because I was basically uh, writing a movie each uh, How I Met Your Mother season, and then I would shoot that movie on the hiatus between How I Met Your Mothers and, go back. and come back just in time. And I did that basically every year. To for, play Marshall over and over and over. Over and over, yeah. 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 So for nine years. Yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of stopping to reflect. And I think that when I was when that show ended and I finally had a minute, I was like, you know, when you entered into this tunnel, mm -hmm. you were 23. Yeah. And what you were thinking about was what a 23-year-old should think about being, you know devastated by a breakup and loving puppets and like all these things that made me who I am. But then I looked in the mirror and I was like, well, but now maybe you're thinking about different stuff yeah. and your art, whatever you want to call it, should be reflective of what you're thinking about now. And it was, uh, I had never thought like that. So it <laughs> took me a while to like figure out how to choose projects. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, how, uh, uh, end of the tour came right at that moment. And and the content of End of the Tour is very much about that. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. like uh, having achieved the stuff and realizing it wasn't making you feel the way you thought it would make you feel and having right. to reevaluate your approach so that it felt good yeah. and sustainable. Um, and I've found that uh, maybe it's like, you know, there's a bit of magnetism to the projects and what you're going through if you're trying to stay open to that. Yeah, and that was a very dramatic, that's a heavy subject yeah. uh, on end of the tour. And you were so good Thank you. in that, you know, but it was, I don't think I'd seen you quite in that kind of a role, go that deep. I hadn't, and I was very scared, you know, yeah, like I yeah. didn't know, if I, yeah, I didn't know if I was capable of doing it. I thought yeah. there's a version of this, if I don't do it well, where it looks like a Saturday Night Live sketch going wrong, wow. where I'm in the glasses and the bandana and I'm <laughs> yeah. not, and I'm doing bad acting and everyone says, yeah. oh my God, this is embarrassing. Yeah. Um, and that was exciting yeah. because I think I've talked about this a little bit, but there is a version of your life where you are forever at the dinner party saying, well, if I had been in the Revenant, I would have <laughs> fought that bear differently. <laughs> and I don't want to be that guy. I want to find out. Yeah. Like, can I, am I capable of doing a drama? I don't know. Find out. Right. What's the worst that happens? You find out you shouldn't do dramas anymore. Yeah. You know? Um, but it's interesting because having gone on these little explorations, then something like Shrinking comes along. Yeah. And it's the synthesis of the dramatic exploration I did. But then, like, don't forget you're good at fucking broad comedy. Well, pardon my language. <laughs> but you're good at that, too. And, like, yeah. combine them. And do it all. Let I it know. be all the things, Right. And it makes it more interesting for you as an actor to play that kind of character uh, that he is with all that complexity going on yeah. that we see where he's coming from. Yeah, good. I'm glad. Thank you. It gives you more to do, I think, uh, in developing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of much acting-wise at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure I will now pursue something that I'm afraid of. But having done something like End of the Tour makes me way less scared when... I'm in a scene and there's Adrian Brody. Like if I hadn't done some of that stuff, I might I might walk onto that set and think I don't belong here. Well, you know, congratulations on shrinking, winning time, all the stuff we're gonna see. Great stuff, uh, Jason Siegel. Thanks for joining us on what the What a great exercise. talk. Hey, thanks a lot. All right. Yeah.